that at this crucial hour for Israel and the world. The only one that came to Israel is the evangelist people. Over 4,000 missiles were fired at the Galilee. We did not want to relive history. Destroy the very existence of the Jewish state. Iran strives to achieve nuclear capability. The last voice of silence, of alarm. Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem. We're here in Mount Zion at the Mount Zion Hotel. And I'm very excited. I have a very, very interesting interview. And I'm so honored. Not only do I have a, uh, a man of God, but a Holocaust survivor, the former chief rabbi of Israel, Israel Meir Lor. Nice to meet you, Rabbi. Thank you. God bless you. I want to start this interview, if I could, with a quote that I've read, uh, and, uh, and it's what we're doing today. It says this. It's very profound. This is your quote. Let's sit down together and let's live together. We always knew how to die together. The time has come for us to know also how to live together. From your point of view right now with, with the conflict that is happening in the Middle East, you have negotiated and you have uh, spoken to uh, many different men. Uh, you have spoken to Fidel Castro, Gorbachev, uh, many powerful leaders in troubled times. And uh, you come to the, to the world for such a time as, as this with a wealth of experience and knowledge. And uh, I, I want to share something uh, here. Uh, the way you arrived to Israel, this is a, this is a photograph of, of Rabbi Lau. Uh, here he is. He's five years old. Eight. Eight. Eight years old in Haifa, Israel. And uh, you returned to Israel, a Holocaust survivor, with your brother uh, Neftali. In these days, there are false prophets, so to say, that are saying that the Holocaust never happened. And of course, we know that's a lie. Would you share with us how uh, from, uh, is it, was it Bokenwald? Uh, Buchenwald. Bokenwald concentration camp. You were released in, I think it was 1945? Right. And, uh, and you came to the land of Eretz Israel. This picture was taken five minutes after my arrival to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, on July 45 to the port of Haifa. When World War II broke out, my parents perished during the Holocaust. I lost my father when I was less than five and a half years old. I lost my mother when I was seven and a half years old. I was liberated in Buchenwald by the American authorities. I was less than eight years old. Uh, for me to hear or to read headlines in the newspapers said uh, by president of a state like Iran, great state, a great nation with a long history, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who denies the very existence of Holocaust. I don't know if it is a joke if it's a tra tragedy of a leader to false the truth, to false history, to deny facts, people with the numbers of the concentration camps tattooed in their arms are still around us, still alive. How can you deny something that dozens of millions of people were involved and were victims of this horror. I would very easily say, look, it's not serious. Let's ignore it. Let's forget about it. But it will be a mistake. I'm afraid an historic mistake. Because World War II and the Holocaust itself started also by these kind of words, not serious words. A corporal from Linitz, Austria, named Adolf Schickel Gruber, 
who changed his name to be Adolf Hitler, joined Germany from Österreich and became a counselor on 1933. Ten years earlier, he made the book, the name of the book, Mein Kampf, My War. And he declared what he is going to do, to liquidate the Jewish people, which is the international poison of all universe. And everyone said, Germany is a cultured nation. The German will not permit it. The world will not keep silence. It cannot be. This man is mad. Don't pay attention. Ten years after the appearing of this book, he became the Chancellor of Germany. Three years later, he gave the laws of Nuremberg, racial laws. Two years later, the Kristallnacht, over 1,000 synagogues were burned in the flames. And ten months later, September the 1st, 39, World War II broke out. He came into Poland, and from three and a half million Jews in Poland, you will find today 15,000 from three and a half millions. So take them serious. The one who denies the crimes of the past is the one who intends to do crimes in future. That's right. And if you give him a hand to deny it, if you don't do anything to oppose it, to condemn it, you support criminal programs of liquidation. And he said very open, very frankly, we have to liquidate Zionism, the Jewish state, to throw it into the Mediterranean, into the sea. We at least, survivors, not very many, we are getting down and down the numbers of survivors. Nature is doing itself. It's 61 years and a half since our liberation. And we must be aware how to encourage knowledge of Holocaust, our Yad Vashem, the museum in Washington, the museum in New York, the Tolerance Museum, the Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles, even the statue in Miami, the hand, to bring them more and more students to see, to learn, to know. And every survivor has to write his own biography because this is the best witness what Spielberg is doing to deny the denials of Holocaust. Mm -hmm. You uh, uh, written your memoirs and uh, with incredible favor from God and favor with man. What I understand is the memoirs are in Hebrew. Uh, Moshe Deir's bestseller had 10,000 copies and now yours has over 100,000 copies telling your story, and from what I understand, it's going to be published in English, and uh, uh, what will the title be in English? And so for our viewers who would like to be able to, uh, to read uh, this book, and I want to encourage our viewers, uh, when you need to buy a gift uh, for a, a brother, a sister, uh, Buy this book because we have to quench this lie from the pit of hell because what the rabbi is saying, by removing the history, then history can repeat itself again. And uh, Rabbi, I just had a, uh, uh, a meeting with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. He said in Los Angeles at a conference here a few months ago that he feels the atmosphere is like 1938 all over again. And so our program, Israel, a land's insight, the men of Israel today, is to bring the truth uh, to the airways so that people can understand. People want the truth. And uh, Nathan Sharansky was here and he talked about the battle for truth and the battle for democracy. But I think your book... Uh, like uh, Esther, uh, has been called for such a time as this, to awaken the church. And I want to carry this book on, 
uh, on our web page. But could you tell me a little bit about what's in the book? Thank you, first of all, for the warm words. In Hebrew, I gave a name taken from the binding of Isaac in the book of Genesis, chapter 22. Al tishlach yadcha el anar. Don't raise your hand against the lad, against the boy. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what the Almighty said to many angels in my early childhood mm -hmm. during Holocaust. Don't hurt the boy. Keep him. Watch him. Mm -hmm. And many messengers, non-Jewish, a doctor of Czechoslovakia, a German man, a Russian prisoner of war, being with me in Buchenwald, endangered their lives to keep me alive. It's incredible. In this book, my book, after Holocaust and after arrival to Israel as an orphan, I describe meetings with the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people, like the Rebbe of Lubavitch and many others here in Israel, and of the world. Gorbachev, Reagan, Clinton, Fidel Castro, the Pope, John Paul II, the Scepter. We have met four times, five times. Nelson Mandela, also a prisoner of another kind. Yitzhak Rabin, let his memory be blessed. And all these meetings, how they are in regarding to my childhood in Holocaust. It's not just an autobiography, what did I do in my life? How Holocaust influenced my life, my leadership, my behavior, if I may say, my personality. In the capital center of Maryland, April 11, 83, exactly the day of our liberation, April 11, 45, President Ronald Reagan was still alive. Maryland, it's Washington DC, not very far, was an engathering of 23,000 survivors from the United States and Canada. I came from Israel, I was that time chief rabbi of a city in Natania here. Yes. And I have met there on the stage with a rabbi who was a chaplain in Patton's division, Rabbi Herschel Schechter of the Bronx, born in the Bronx. Let him be in long life and good health. He is watching us now on the TV. Oh, that's wonderful. He met me when he entered into Buchenwald, when the gate was broken. I was hidden behind a heap of corpses. He lifted me up in his arms. He braced me. This was the first Jew he had met. He was 45 already. Mm -hmm. A soldier, a Jewish soldier, an Orthodox Jewish young rabbi meeting a Jewish child in the hell. Bleeding, he didn't know it's my blood or the blood of the corpses around. He smiled to me, he cried. Then he asked me in Yiddish, Yiddish he knew, how old are you, my child? And I said, what difference does it make? I am older than you. He was completely sure that I am not normal. He said, why do you think that you are older than me? I am a soldier, look my uniform. He said, because you cry and you smile like a child. I stopped laughing years ago and even to cry, I don't cry anymore. So who is older? This happened in Maryland, and President Reagan came on the stage offering his hand to me. He was very touched mm. by the story and the whole scene. The Pope, when I entered to him, not in the Vatican, we have met in his summer house in Castel Gandolfo. It was on September 1993. He said to me, I remember your grandfather, Rabino Frankel Teomim, walking in the street in Krakow, Poland, 
on Sabbath, surrounded with very many children. How many grandchildren did you have? The answer is 47 grandchildren, including my brother and myself. And how many survived Holocaust? Asked the Pope. The answer was only five. Three in the two in the United States, three in Israel. Five among forty seven. He looked at the ceiling and after a while he said, Wherever I go, and I was visiting over a hundred countries. I always repeat that all of us, mankind, are obliged and committed to the future and the continuity of our senior brother, the Jewish people. Later on, when we have met in Jerusalem, he came to my office. We went together to Yad Vashem. We went to the Kotel, the Wailing Wall, and then in the amphitheater of uh, Notre Dame, where his hotel was, belongs to the church, there was a symposium about peace. Sheikh El Tamimi representing the Islam, the Pope representing the church, and me representing Judaism. How every one of us looked, what's his outlook, his concept about accomplishing peace. What did you bring to that peace conference? You said earlier that the Holocaust and that experience shaped your character. So what uh, wisdom from the root of that character, what did you bring into that conference? I will tell you. Two days before I have met with the Pope, I was in Milan, in La Scala, with Cardinal Martini, representative of the Islam, a professor from Uran, Algeria, and an atheist, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was at that time the president of the Soviet Union yet. And I said to them, don't we have common enemies today? Cancer is not a common enemy. Poverty, crime, violence, AIDS, atom, missiles, they are not common enemies. When there is a common enemy, we have to shake hands and to live together. What difference does it make? What is your nationality? What is your religion? What is your race? What is your color? What is your knowledge? What is your social economy situation? We are all human beings. We have the same father. That's what the Holocaust told me. It's only in our hands. Don't be fatalistic. Say, what can I do? People fatalistic. When they meet one, the other in difficult times, they say, which is what will be. This is not the real question, the question has to be, what shall we do? That's right. Not what will be. Will be means I have nothing to say, nothing to do. What will be? Mm -hmm. What shall we do and what shall we be? Good or God forbid bad? Mm -hmm. Rabbi, uh in 1990, my wife and I came to Israel for the first time. I was a new Christian, and I walked down the beach across from the Dan Panorama in Tel Aviv. And as I walked down the beach, this man was sharing with me the, about the Holocaust. And I didn't know much about it other than what I had heard about in history and school and a little bit of television. I was raised in Los Angeles, California, so I'm, I was informed to a degree. But as this man was sharing the horrors and the deep hurt and the tears were running down my face, I wasn't a minister then. I was just a fruit broker. I sold fruit for a living to grocery stores. That's what I did. And as I walked down the beach that day in 1990, uh, I told God, I said, not on my watch. Never again 
will the church be silent and let this happen again? I said, not on my watch. And I prayed to God. I said, give me a platform. Give me a place where I can share. Give me a voice because I know when the propaganda comes for an attempt of removing the Jewish people. I want to be a voice. Give me that platform. And so here we sit today in Jerusalem. And uh, the program I have, my personal program, uh, 12 million viewers. And we've partnered with another ministry on this project that has over 50 million viewers. And God has given me this platform to be able to bring a witness like, like you. It says in the book of Revelations uh, chapter 12, uh, it says, And they overcame him, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved their lives not unto death. And that your testimony, I can tell you, your words are, are life to me, and, uh, and they're speaking life to me, and they're speaking life to these viewers because we should learn that we don't want to relive history. We must come together, the church, Jews and Gentiles, we must come together and be that witness for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I want to uh, ask you a question about the current situation in Israel. I, I know that uh, you uh, have strong influence in this country. What, what word are you speaking to leaders in Israel and the leaders in other countries today. What, what's the current word about the current situation? I try to encourage people not to be desperate. I try to open the eyes and the hearts to see what is unifying us and not what is separating us. There is a Jewish phrase by our old sages people, human beings, as much as they are different by their outlook, by their faces, they also have different minds and thoughts. What's the discovery of this phrase? Every child knows it. That people are not alike the same. You can identify who is who. And they have different thoughts. So what is the message of this phrase? The message according to Judaism is very simple, and you will agree with me. If someone is not like me in the color of his hair or eyes or the length of his nose, is this a reason to hate him? Is this a reason to fight him? If he has a different mind, if he believes differently than you, this is not a reason to hate him, to fight him. That's the idea. So let's agree sometimes that we disagree upon one, two, and three. But we are human beings. We have the same needs. We can find many, many things in common. Let's see them. This is lesson number one. Lesson number two, when I speak to my leaders in my country, I tell them, I remind them the past, the history of the Jewish heritage. Be loyal to it. Be loyal to the roots of the Jewish tradition. Because if you pay tribute to the past, you have a real chance for a brilliant future as well. There is no future without past. And each nation and each religion, each faith has the roots, has the fundaments. If you pay tribute to them, you are founded on real fundaments. It's That's very powerful. Very, very simple. Very powerful. See, and for our Christians in Romans 11, it says you've been grafted in to this olive tree. And, uh, uh, and the scripture also says, if the lump, God, be holy, then so are the branches. And uh, 
we have a rich heritage that we have been grafted into, not to replace, but to come alongside. And I believe that if you look at the scriptures in Isaiah, uh, particularly in like Isaiah 60, it says that the Gentiles will arise. But it also says that the wealth of the Gentiles shall come to the nation of Israel and foreigners shall come, non-Jews, to help rebuild your walls. But it That's also, what you are doing. Yes, that's what we're doing on this program. But we're also, there's a warning because it says, and the nations that will not bless and will not serve will be utterly destroyed. Because as Jews and as Christians, we stand as a witness that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the one and only true God. And he is not a man that he should lie. The prophet Isaiah, I love the way he says this when he's speaking to the world. And he says, who is this that foretold you these things? Am I not God? It says, believe and be saved. And as we sit here this day on Mount Zion, just a few feet away from where Palmach was uh, cabling over ammunition and food and people, into the city of Jerusalem, as we come to uh, this place and, and this mountain, the scripture says the word of the Lord would come from this mountain. And I believe, Rabbi, what you're speaking today to our viewers and you're speaking to me is a word, is a word from God. Is there anything else you would like to share? I want to thank you for your friendship, for your initiative, for your goodwill, for your good deeds, not only will. There are people who want to do good things, but they are doing nothing. <laughs> but you made a lot in order to build a bridge, a humanity bridge between the people of Israel and you people whom you represent, the millions of the United States and America, who feel themselves friends to the Jewish people and to the Israeli state exactly in the vision of the prophets. Mika, the prophet, said the sentence, every nation will follow his Lord, the Lord Almighty. We have, the Jewish people has Hashem Elokeinu, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, as we have mentioned. Everyone, we are not enforcing one the other. We live in peace, in friendship, in brotherhood even, everyone. So when you show it and you prove it by your several visits to Israel, supporting the people in Sderot who suffer so much by the scars, the missiles, the Qassams from Beit Hanun, from Rafa, from the Gaza Strip, it's offering a hand of brotherhood, something we appreciate very much. We thank you, we bless you to go from strength to strength, and God will bless you and the whole globe in peace, prosperous, brotherhood and friendship. Thank you. Rabbi Lau, I want to thank you and bless you for being such a blessing. Okay. And on behalf of the evangelical community, may God bless you richly you. You with long years, many years of bringing good your health. testament and good health thank you. and prosperity. Thanks and so we thank you so much. You. And, uh, and I personally thank you for bringing this word uh, from God to me. And uh, thank you so much. Many thanks to you. You are very welcome. Thank you. Shalom, Bye -bye. shalom. Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem. Hi, my name is Kurt Landry and I'm founder and president of House of David Ministries. We have a great opportunity in this hour to bless this city and to bless the country of Israel from the far north to the deepest south. Would you join us in helping us to protect and minister to the children here in Israel? The statistics tell us that more than 720,000 children are under the poverty level right now in this city. And I believe the evangelical community is being blessed for 2,000 years by the covenants of God to answer that call at this hour. Would you join us as we take you on a wonderful tour of an opportunity to bless Israel and to bless its children. And may God bless you as you give. And remember, 
Pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all of Israel. And may God bless you out of Zion. Shalom.